During my years in public life, I had the opportunity of meeting any number of world leaders, but none, and I repeat, none, was or is more deserving of the appellation great than is Nelson Mandela. I am an ordinary human being with weaknesses, some of them fundamental. And I've made many mistakes in my life. I am not a saint unless you think of a saint as a sinner who keeps on trying. Hmm. That was part of a tribute video from the Baker Institute for Public Policy, honoring the legacy of Nelson Mandela. And joining us now, the honorary chair of the Baker Institute, former Secretary of State James Baker. Good to see you, and sir. And Mr. Secretary, so great to have you here. Thank you have met so thank many world thank leaders you. and worked with so many world leaders throughout your life, and yet you say Nelson Mandela stands apart. Tell us why. Well, I think he does. I, I, one reason, uh, Joe, is that he's just uh, very simply uh, a, a beautiful human being. Um, here he was in jail for 27 years. I met with him the month after he got out, the first uh, high-level American official to meet with him. And he, had, uh, he was talking in terms of reconciliation and forgiveness. He even said some nice things about the, apar the, the apartheid, the then apartheid president of South Africa, F.W. de Klerk. He said, uh, you know, Mr. Secretary, I've read some of his speeches, and I feel like I'm dealing with a man of integrity. And, it, and he went on to work with F.W. de Klerk. The two of them saw to it uh, that there was a peaceful transition of power in South Africa. And it didn't, didn't, happen, it didn't hap have to happen that way. I mean, he, he really was uh, a man of, of endearing and enduring dignity. Well, and we were just talking to Colin Powell, uh, who said that he remembered in 1994 going to his inauguration and seeing him sit his jailers on the front row. Uh, he was constantly bending over backwards to actually forgive those who had persecuted him. And do you suppose there would have never been a resolution, a peaceful resolution, without Mandela's bigness of spirit? I think it's very doubtful whether there would have been a peaceful transition without uh, Nelson Mandela. I mean, and, and, uh, and you're quite right, that, big, that spirit was extraordinarily big. Uh, and, and he was just, really, as I said, he was just a very beautiful uh, human being. And you, you, when you dealt with him, you met with him, he, he was very reserved, he was very uh, careful in his, uh, in his uh, uh, language. He, and yet he'd come from a background of revolution. He was one of the few leaders that I can think of who successfully made the transition from being a revolutionary to being a statesman. Harold Ford, uh, and, and, But he did it. Mr. Secretary, good it. morning. Uh, Harold Ford, you've compared uh, President Mandela to Washington, to Jefferson, to Adams, uh, being the father of, of his country, in so many ways the father of a continent. Elaborate on that point right. as you think about his legacy and the lessons he gives not only to leaders in Africa, but leaders around the world as we navigate a very challenging time. Well, I'm, I'm uh, glad to, uh, to hear from you, Congressman. I hope you're well. I, I think, you know, you look at the way Nelson Mandela operated, the way he governed, the way he dealt with his opponents, and you have to say to yourself, boy, oh boy, wouldn't it be great if we could have some of that back in, <laughs> and, and, and in, in our politics in, in, here in the United States? It would be so great if people yeah. would start working together again to accomplish things for the country. That's what he did uh, first and foremost. Uh, you know, he was soft-spoken, but he remained committed to that revolution that had defined his entire adult life. And, and he didn't give anything away by... by by forgiving his enemies and working with them. Yep. Brian Shackman. Secretary Baker, uh, Brian Shackman here. Take us back, you know, the, the years ago to the policy back then. How difficult was the United States and its policy towards South Africa? It was, it was a very difficult problem. Uh, and in fact, it was the, the, the one time 
that Ronald Reagan uh, uh, lost control of foreign policy. Uh, it would be policy in those days was one of constructive engagement. Work with the South African apartheid government. Use the uh, carrots and sticks of, uh, of diplomacy and uh, and economic and political uh, sanctions to get them to change their government. Well, the Congress uh, and others, other countries around the world, didn't like that policy, and s sooner or later. The Congress took over for that, that aspect of uh, foreign policy from the president. They passed the sanctions bill. Reagan vetoed it. They overrode his veto. It was the only veto override that I'm aware of that, that President Reagan uh, suffered during his entire presidency. He wasn't happy about it, but it happened. And, and so the policy changed, and we began to uh, meet with the uh, uh, more moderate uh, leaders, uh, black leaders of South Africa, uh, 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 including uh, Walter Sisulu and uh, Desmond Tutu and others. And the policy uh, changed, and, but it wasn't until Nelson Mandela was released from prison and came back and took over as the leader of the African National Congress that the two sides were able to work, sit down and work together to accomplish that peaceful transition. Right. Former Secretary of State James Baker, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Mika, Mika tell your old man hello for me, will you? I sure <laughs> we see a lot of things. We, hey, we see, a lot of thi we see a lot of things the same way on many foreign policy issues. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you thank very you. much. <laughs> see you soon. Up next, if anyone...